everybody and welcome to the next Wednesday webinar session from us here at Natulic. And today is all around home Wi-Fi and how to get the best out of your setup. And um, we all know that there are a lot of challenges of everybody fighting over um, Wi-Fi at the moment. So I'm going to pass over to Mac and Matt, who are going to take you through everything for today. Okay. Over to you. Thank you, Hayley. So I'm Mark Daring, wireless product engineer at Natilic. We are working in the same wireless team with Matt. Uh, Matt has added to the slides, it seems like I'm Matt's PA. So I'm managing his uh, calendar, flights, and you know, if you want something from Matt, you can let me know. I will let him know. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you spotted my little addition or not there, Max. So. <laughs> of course I did. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm Matt Styling. I'm also a wireless project engineer that works with Mac at Natidic, and we will be delivering this presentation to you today on home Wi-Fi. So this is what we are going to talk about today. So first of all, we'll talk about some Wi-Fi basics, and then we'll talk about home Wi-Fi complaints about what bothers users at home when it comes to the Wi-Fi typical causes of bad Wi-Fi at home, and tips on, on how to fix those bad home Wi-Fi things. And we'll cover it up with summary, and then at the end we'll have Q&A. If you have any questions, you can type them in, and then we will try to answer them. So before we dive into the home Wi-Fi presentation, we just wanted to kind of give a kind of like Wi-Fi 101 and make sure that everyone that's on or listening today understands at least like the basics of how Wi-Fi operates currently. So we have two frequency bands that Wi-Fi operates at at the moment in the UK, and that's 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. And at the moment, Wi-Fi is, well, the Wi-Fi is half duplex. So what we mean by half duplex is that Wi-Fi is a very polite protocol. So if one device is transmitting, all other devices have to listen or wait their turn to be able to transmit. And in the 2.4 gigahertz frequency band, we currently have three non-overlapping channels when using 20 megahertz wide channels. We will discuss channels a little bit further because that's going to um, play a big part in how to optimize your home Wi-Fi in a few slides time. But also to bear in mind that the 2.4 gigahertz band is much more susceptible to non-wireless interference. So if you have a lot of like baby monitors at home, lots of Bluetooth devices, microwave ovens, they can play a part into interfering with your 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. Whereas the five gigahertz frequency band in the UK, we have just around over 20 non-overlapping channels when using a 20 megahertz wide channel. And the five gigahertz band is a lot less susceptible to non-wireless interference compared to the 2.4. Exactly. Okay, so this is the visualization of, of what Matt has just mentioned. So what we see here, we can see first 2.4 gigahertz band and as Matt has mentioned, we have three non-overlapping channels, but you can see that there are 13 available channels or 14 in some, in some countries, but only channels 1, 6, and 11, normally they don't overlap. We'll talk a little bit more about what overlapping means, but just, you know, this is to help you visualize. And just to compare to 5 gigahertz, you can see in the bottom part of the picture that 5 gigahertz has quite a lot of channels and actually it's 25 channels now available. We don't, well, not all the vendors use all of them, but 25 versus three channels is quite a lot of a difference. So five gigahertz is much easier for everyone to sit on a dedicated non-overlapping channel. Okay, so typical end user complaints of home Wi-Fi. So one of the first complaints that you usually hear with, you, with your home Wi-Fi is that there's either weak or no signal. So what that translates to is that probably you've got poor coverage in places around your house. And then sometimes you're just unable to connect. And that would translate to you're too far away from the access point home router, or you've normally typed in the wrong password. And I think this is probably one of the most typical complaints of Wi-Fi is that the Wi-Fi is slow. 
and that could be because there is too much congestion or capacity on Wi-Fi currently. And also you can have a choppy audio or bad video quality. And that might mean that you are uh, being affected by channel contention or adjacent channel interference, so noise neighbors. Shall we just spend like a second here, Matt, talking about what the channel contention means actually? Go for it. Okay. So as we mentioned, we have just three non-overlapping channels on 2.4 gigahertz band versus 25 on 5 gigahertz. And very quickly, it means that, you know, Wi-Fi being a polite protocol, as Matt has mentioned, it means that if you have multiple clients on a single channel, they will wait for the turn. So they will contend for the airtime. If you have 100 clients, only one at a time will be able to talk or receive transmission. And all those clients, they will, you know, try to get their cut of the airtime to, to talk or, trans or receive the transmission. If you have multiple access points in the same geographical area, doesn't matter if it's your access point or your neighbors, if you are sitting on the same channel, all the devices associated to these access points on the same channel, they will contend for the same airtime. So if you have 10 devices, your neighbor has 10 devices, it's equivalent to having 20 devices associated to a single access point for as long as yours and your neighbor's router operate on the same channel. So our aim is to avoid interference with our neighbors, not to have any uh, channel contentions. So every access point in the geographical area sits on a different channel, so we don't have to contend for this airtime. So just, again, if you want to have clear Wi-Fi, steer away from, from your neighbor, uh, from neighbors. And what also is a usual complaint from home Wi-Fi is that applications are crashing or freezing because of the Wi-Fi connections quite poor. So that could lead to what we call something called low SNR and SNR is signal to noise ratio. So that's the difference between what signal you receive compared to the noise floor for other Wi-Fi or non-Wi-Fi transmissions happening in the background. Of course, so if your microwave is louder than the transmission from the access point, it means that the noise will be louder than the received signal and therefore devices, they won't be able to understand what your home Wi-Fi router is telling them. Okay. And even if you have the most perfect Wi-Fi in your house or your apartment, coverage everywhere, good SNR, if you have very slow broadband, there's nothing you can do about that with the Wi-Fi, and it will still be the Wi-Fi that gets the complaint. So if you are in a situation where you are just still using old copper DSL broadband, um, this way you might see some poor speed tests. So if you go to the next slide, Mac. Yeah, so please, uh, I want some more bandwidth. If you are in a situation where you can upgrade to a fibre, then we highly recommend that you upgrade to some form of fibre broadband to get faster speeds so that that's going to not be your problem is the backhaul. Yeah, it can be quite expensive though, so it, it really can be quite expensive. So I, I was recently updating my home broadband and the packages they have here, they are not as fast as like Virgin back in London. I live in Midlands now and I pay about like 50 pounds for like 75 max, which is not too bad, but I'm sure that you can have it cheaper if you have more competition. So it's not only about asking, it's about paying as well in most cases. So common causes of bad home Wi-Fi's, consumer versus enterprise access point. So on the left hand side, you can see like a standard BT hub. And on the right hand side, you can see a Cisco juicy new beautiful access point uh, designed in Italy by Pinifarina. And the difference is between the two, not only in the looks, but also in the quality of the Wi-Fi components, wireless components that they have inside. So the quality of radios, quality of electronics, the purpose is different. In enterprise, normally you would have more access points and clients jumping between those access points. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want all the you know, clients from a single floor to be associated to a single access point. While at home, you would expect all your devices to be able to have some Wi-Fi connectivity from this one single home router device. So they are different. And enterprise access points, they will normally provide us with better 
quality of Wi-Fi signal. Yeah, so just as a, a bit of an example there, the BT Home Hub router is like driving a Toyota Prius, whereas the Cisco wireless access point is like driving a Tesla. They both do similar things, but in very, very different ways. And if anyone's familiar with this advert from BT with Mr. Ryan Reynolds hanging out of a helicopter going, oh, I still got Wi-Fi because BT were boasting that they've got the most powerful, strongest signal in the whole UK. Pretty much every single Wi-Fi engineer at this moment put their heads in their hands because they was translating what that actually meant. So what are BT doing to have the most strongest and powerful furthest away connection with Wi-Fi? Well, that means that they're going to be using their wireless devices to transmit on maximum power and not only just maximum power that they use like the biggest channel widths possible and then not just the biggest channel widths they have all of the low basic legacy data rates enabled which we'll probably cover in a, a little bit uh later time on some further slides but yeah and some i just wanted to uh, add here that you know if the access point is very powerful so the client can here, the access is very nice and clear. It doesn't work in the other direction like that, right? So the, our mobile devices, they don't have as powerful antennas. So we are asking for trouble and we are just contributing to more channel contention that we now know is bad. So more so power. Yeah, I'm going to say Mr. Reynolds there, his iPads can hear the BT router, but not back in the other direction probably. Yeah, but he still seems happy on this helicopter. Yeah. Okay, another uh, biggest challenge in home environment is the placement of the access point of the home router. So like you can see on the middle picture, uh, there is like a cupboard storage under the stairs. That's normally when you have your Wi-Fi, well, where I have my Wi-Fi uh, at home by design. So the BT point terminated there. So if I left it on default, I would have my home router under the stairs in a full story house, which is probably not the greatest. Also, if you stick, yeah, go for it, Matt. I was going to say, it's, it's nice for you to share the picture of your stairs with everyone. That's your guest room when you come over. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And also, if you, like, you know, stick your access points with a, a tape to the ceiling, it might not be a permanent solution. But probably it's not too bad for the waves propagation, but it might be that we might have some health and safety issues there. And so, you know, access point, it must be put in a nice position with ideally line of sight between the access point and the wireless clients away from obstructions, away from closed cupboards, storage rooms behind the furniture in, you know, in the ceiling or, you know, it just has to be outside basically. And if you can mount it higher up, then it's, it's good. So, one of the other big issues that we see with home Wi-Fi is the fact that all ISPs have this really nasty default configuration where they um, transmit on the maximum power, they use the widest possible channels, um, and they have all of the lowest data rates enabled. So it means people can connect from really far away and transmit data at a very slow speed, making it very slow for everyone else. They use all of the Uni1 spectrum in five gigahertz, which is the only non-DFS channels in, um, well, the non-DFS channel band in, in Uni1. And yeah, they transmit maximum power, so they cover really far, so they don't play nicely with neighbors usually. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about. Again, we have five gigahertz channels displayed on the screen. And this is just a subset of most of the internet service providers. Uh, that's what they can offer with their home equipment. So even though we have just, you know, 20 plus available channels, most of them, we've tested BT, we've tested Sky, we've tested Virgin, uh, all, well, Virgin actually, I think it could operate in a higher band, but most of them, they can just use this four channels. So if entire neighborhood uses Sky or BT, everyone will be using channel primary 36 bonded together with 40, 44, and 48, which is not great. And then this image is probably one of my favorite 
analogies when it when it comes to to Wi-Fi. So hopefully everyone on the call recognises um, the UK's largest car park, which is also known as the M25. So for this analogy, we can see that there's four lanes going in both directions. So that we we just spoke there about the five gigahertz band and the first four channels being in UD1 that are not affected by DFS. So what happens is that a single car is using a, a 20 megahertz wide channel staying in its lane and other cars can go past it at different speeds. Um, and then we see here a wide load lorry, which is taking up two lanes of the M25. And this wide load, load lorry can't go as fast as the um, Volvo on the right hand side that's in the fast lane. So then other cars that can go faster than this wide load lorry because it's using two lanes they have to slow down or use it or there's not as many lanes to use now so um, this is how exactly how Wi-Fi works we have four channels in five in the five first five first part of five gigahertz band and what most ISPs are doing they're bonding their channels together so not even just like this wide load lorry taking up two lanes they're taking up all four of the lanes using an 80 megahertz wide channel when they could just use a smaller 20 megahertz channel and then there'd be more channels available to use um yeah exactly and that brings us to uh, the quite uh, popular topic right now of social distancing so that is why we want to use channels 1 6 and 11 we want to keep 25 megahertz distance between those channels to make sure that they don't overlap so that's how you would normally put your 2.4 channels on 1, 6, and 11 keep social distancing. Okay, that's why. So now we've spoken about the channels. Um, everyone pretty much has got their own home Wi Fi, but also everyone else around you probably got their own home Wi Fi and Wi Fi devices. So the biggest interferer of Wi Fi is actually other Wi Fi. So I, for example, live in a block of apartments where I'm in the middle floor and I've got neighbors to my left, to my right, above and below me, and everyone's got Wi-Fi and I can hear all of my neighbors' Wi-Fi, which I'll show you in a few screenshots time that you'll be able to see how much of a Wi-Fi that I can hear from my device in, in my apartment. And we've learned from how most ISPs have their Wi-Fi configured on default is that it's not going to play very nicely with my neighbors. And I don't quite have a rocking granny to my to my right. But in terms of Wi-Fi, it's very similar that people are just trying to transmit at maximum power and it's very loud all the time. So it's very hard for my Wi-Fi. If I was to just be using the same channels, it would be very hard to have good working Wi-Fi at home. And that's your home. Yes, this is a screenshot from uh, my Mac that I have... Um, a piece of piece of software running called Wi-Fi from me, you mean? Pro. No, not from you. From an actual Mac MacBook Pro. Um, so what we can see here is that I personally at home I have uh, a SkyQ router and I have a SkyQ main box in my front room and then I have a SkyQ mini box in my bedroom. And I've highlighted them there by selecting them, so that's why they're blue. And then I put a like a red box around the channels um, and my um, actual access point that I am using for my day-to-day -day use is from my missed access point, which is the Wi-Fi Ninja's SSID, which you can see on the bottom right part of the um, screenshot that I pretty much have the whole spectrum to myself. There's no one else over there. Whereas if you look at where my Sky Q box on five gigahertz is sitting, not only is there other Sky devices and um, BT uh, hubs I can hear on similar channels to what I'm using, but also my SkyQ boxes, they talk to each other via wireless. So that means that each box is transmitting from on the same channel on 5 gigahertz, um, the same SSID. So that means there's three SSIDs being transmitted from my SkyQ boxes. Um, which can which creates just contention from 
the Sky Q boxes so that when you are downloading a movie, say from your Sky on your Sky Mini box from your Sky Q box, that's done over wireless. So yeah, we can see here that it's using by default 80 megahertz wide channels, and we can see the um, in the 2.4 band that it's actually using channels 1, 6, and 11. So in 2.4, they are avoiding each other, playing nicely how it should be. But on 5 gigahertz, they're using 80 megahertz wide channels and all on the same channel. So I'll show you in a few slides time how you can configure your Sky Q to work a little bit better and some recommendations for um, best practices with Sky Q at home. Okay, thank you, Matt. And this is, this is the floor plans of my house. So let's just quickly discuss the placement of the access points and what is the thought process when it comes to the positioning of the access point. So when I moved in, you can see on the left-hand side the ground floor plan, and you can see a C in a circle. It means it's a cupboard under my stairs. So that's where I have the fiber termination of a BT line. And, you know, I have three floors. So when I had the BT home hub in there, it was all right on the ground floor. It was acceptable on the first floor. And in the middle of the screen, you can see the first floor, there is a bedroom three. That's where my office is uh, with the big red rectangle. It's my, it's my desk. And by the time the signal reaches my office from the ground floor cupboard, it was already very low. It was usable for data, but it, it didn't give me too much you know, space for, for voice or video. It was fluctuating a little bit, sometimes to the point where the quality wasn't good enough to provide the Wi-Fi services that I would expect from my you know, fiber home Wi-Fi. And then when you go to the second floor on the right-hand side of the master bedroom, the signal has to penetrate two floors, and it's, it's quite a lot. So it's not only like a vertical distance that, that matters here, but also uh, the materials from, you know, from the ceiling floors that attenuate the Wi-Fi signal. And in the master bedroom on 5 gigahertz, I couldn't connect at all. And 2.4 gigahertz, very congested, by the way, was faint. So I couldn't have that, of course. So what I did, I installed one access point per floor, okay, because I thought that it's going to be a great idea. And I had an access point in a cupboard on the ground floor, then one access point on the first floor when a very small rectangle is, uh, is shown, uh, so in the landing. And then on the second floor, I had another access point in the cupboard around the staircase. So I had a massively great RSSI signal strength throughout the house. But I introduced another problem here. So I didn't interfere with my neighbors. That wasn't a problem there. But the problem was that when I was connecting to the Wi-Fi on the ground floor, even on 5 gigahertz, let's say, by the time I go to the first floor, I would expect to connect to the access point that sits on the first floor that is just next to me. But it wasn't happening. I was still associated to the AP on the ground floor because it was, from perspective of my device, good enough. So my device wouldn't even scan for better access point. And then when I was going to the second floor, I would associate to the AP on the second floor. So to have good Wi-Fi in my office, you know, I know that the signal is there, but to connect to the access point that's close to me, I had to turn my Wi-Fi off and on again sometimes to make sure that I'm connected to the access point that is close to me. So, you know, in this example, when the coverage is there, but it's just not not good enough you might you might want to keep the number of access points to minimum because if every access point covers most of the house you won't be able to reliably tell your devices or let your devices to make a decision about which access point to connect to ensuring they're connecting to the closest best access point so what i've done <clears throat> i just installed a good quality access point. This one, <clears throat> sorry, this one was from, from Cisco, actually. And I installed it on the first floor when the red rectangle is. And that's how it's installed. I installed it like, you know, against the ceiling. 
in a kind of open space, as open as I could have done. It's very close to all three bedrooms on this floor, including my office. So we have a really good quality on the first floor. On the ground floor, it's not as good as on the first, but it's still good enough, even outside in the garden and on my like, you know, IoT devices, uh, like uh, Hello Bells. So you have like a doorbell with camera, it's still good enough there. And on the second floor as well, so we have one solid access point mounted in the perfect position in the house that covers everything very nicely. And not only uh, works as an access point for you, it's also a, a nightlight if you are uh, with the LED. <laughs> That's true, yes. And it really works as a nightlight quite nicely. Yeah, no. So now we're taking a look at uh, my, the floor plan of my apartment and where I have my access point currently positioned. So we can see that it's pretty central. Um, it's in between the main bedroom, bedroom one, and the living room and dining area space. And I've been working in Wi-Fi now for the best part of 10, 10 years. And one of the biggest issues that I usually come across when after doing a design and getting to the implementation stages, um, working with architects and how offended they are by having white access points on their beautiful ceilings um, and trying to get sign off from uh, an architect on if we can put this access point in this position or do we have to or can you not just slightly move it so it's a bit out of the way or put it above the ceiling tile or can you get a spray paint and spray it the same color so these kind of challenges i thought uh, i'm not going to have any of these kind of issues when i get to my apartment but it wasn't the, really the case because i wanted to put an access point beautifully on the ceiling as well but my wife francesca had other plans she thought it looked ugly being up on the ceiling so i instead just put it on top of my desk if you go to the next slide please mac of course thank you very much so very I, well. um, I just have my access point sitting on top of my desk in my um second bedroom which we use as like a office slash dressing room usually but has now transformed into an office slash dressing room slash gym since we can't go to the gym with the current state of the climate at the moment but um nonetheless the wi-fi still works spotlessly everywhere throughout my apartment so getting um your ap positioning correct or your wi-fi home route is very important so always try and go somewhere central and try and be away from any kind of obstructions and how can anyone say that this access point is ugly i don't understand it's beautiful i know it's especially when you start saying, okay, well, how about those smoke alarms and fire exit signs, and water sprinklers that you've got to have sticking out of the ceilings, but this one white access point, okay. I have a solution for it as well, which is also quite relevant to home Wi-Fi because I connected all the smart sensors, which are also connecting to the access points. So I have like 49 devices associated to my AP and it still works. I don't think it would work with a BT Hub. Okay, moving on. So how to uh, check if your Wi-Fi is good or bad? So probably just by using it, you will have a good understanding of if it works, if it works all right, or where it doesn't work. Uh, but to be sure, and uh, if you want to have like a methodological approach on you know, collecting the data about the uh, Wi-Fi quality, you can use some free powerful tools available on the market. So the first tool that we wanted to briefly talk about is the WinFi. Uh, that's the tool that, uh, done by Mr. Helge Heck, our friend. It's an amazing piece of software that will allow you to use your Windows laptop Wi-Fi enabled to scan your Wi-Fi and understand what channel are you using, what channels are your neighbors using, what are the channel widths that you and your neighbors are using, and if the and the free channels in your neighborhood that you could put your equipment on, assuming that you can support it, to steer away from your neighbors. Uh, just a very quick glance at the software. Uh, can you see it all right? Matt? Yes, mate. Okay. So, extremely quick look at it. This is just a live scan of my network, so you can see that I don't have too many neighbors around on 5 gigahertz. I can see that I have just one network, that's my network with a stronger SSI. I can see that I have 
just 11 stations connected on 5 gigahertz and the channel utilization is 2%, which is very low, so it's amazing. But if I wanted to use 2.4, you can see that it's, you know, it's not as great anymore. So you can have multiple networks on channels 11, 1, even 2, which is, you know, it's bad. You don't want to have any networks on channels 2. So this should be punished and it's also hidden. And 1 and 6 and 3 again. So, you know, there is nothing clear in 2.4 for me to use. And you can see that the channel utilization is very high, 66%, 30 27 All of it is not good enough to carry a good voice transmission, let's say. And by voice transmission, I mean like, you know, Skype or WebEx or, uh, you know, WhatsApp call uh, with video or without video. It just wouldn't work on this 2.4. On 5 gigs, it would be amazing. So with tools like this, you can just take your computer around your house and you can see if it's good, if it's bad, why is it good or why is it bad. Going back to the slides. Yeah, I think that's key because if you were connected right now on your 2.4 network, the uh, audio would be very choppy compared to now on your 5 gigahertz. It's spotless. Exactly. Okay. So moving on to if you have a, a Mac and you want to use um, a scanning tool, which from the screenshot you saw earlier, I was using the pro version of Wi-Fi Explorer from Adrian Granados. Um, he has three different flavors of Wi-Fi Explorer. He has a, a free version where you get some like very basic features, um, a standard version, which I think is like 10 or $20 maybe, and then the pro version, which is $99. So it depends on how much you want to have a look at the um, Wi-Fi with your Mac and the scanning tools. Um, go for whatever option suits you best. Um, but you can see what Mac just showed you, um, and actually you can see quite a bit more in, in the Pro version than you can in WinFi. And also, Macs are just better than Windows. So <laughs> I kind of like my environment here now, at least. Yeah, it's finally nearly as good as mine. Okay, so that's the quick live demo that we've just done, right? Yeah, you, you did it a little bit out of sync, but never mind. Okay, um, and a little bit more tools for, for the mobile devices? Yes, uh, if you press play or hit next, it should start playing. There's a little video. Um, now, if you wanted to, uh, on your mobile device, have a look at the um, signal strength that's being received from your mobile device. On iOS, there's an app called Airport Utility. And if you install the app, the app and go to the settings and then turn on Wi-Fi scan, which was just playing in that video, um, then you can go to the airport utility and start a Wi-Fi scan. And you will start to see um, the different SSIDs that are being broadcast in your area that your phone can hear, the signal strength that it receives it at, and what channel it is using, which is a very nice and handy tool to check to see what signal you have on your mobile device. And then on the bottom right-hand corner, there's a little eye information if you press that it will tell you the channel usage so how many devices are working on channel one how many devices are on channel six and then how many devices are on channel 11 for 2.4 then in the five gigahertz band it will tell you what channels it had um, devices on so on channel 36 it had nine devices when i did my scan on my iphone okay that's quite a lot nine devices on the same channel assuming that yeah. it's not all your devices no, it's not my devices. It's because, like I said, I'm in the middle floor of a block of apartments where I've got neighbors all around me using Wi-Fi or using the default configs. And that's why I steer away from channel 36. <laughs> for a good reason. Okay. Yes. And for Android, we, we have very similar tools. So actually, when Matt has an edge on his Mac with the Wi-Fi Explorer Pro, I think Android users have an edge with their mobile Wi-Fi scanners. So they're really good scanner, easy to use, and very, very fast and reliable is one uh, done by uh, Ubiquiti, I think. It's called the Wi-Fi Man, and you can see uh, it on the screenshots right, right now. So you can even visualize the channels, what devices are you know sitting on what channel. It's doing some ARP sweep, so you can see exactly the names of the devices, you know their IP addresses, and it's absolutely amazing like for a mobile scanning tool so for the sake of this quick scan it's pretty much the same as the WinFi or Wi-Fi Explorer Pro with just a slight changes that you will not see 
information like you know channel utilization or number of associated stations on every you know channel or SSID, you won't have that on your mobile devices. So for that, you will have to open up your, your laptop. But for basics, it's good enough. So now that we've shown you what tools you can use to check to see if you've got any coverage issues in your in your home, um, now we need to work out how we can fix those coverage issues. And to fix coverage issues, the only way you're going to get around that is if you haven't already moved your home Wi-Fi to a central place in your home with no obstructions. If that if you still have poor coverage, then we're going to need to get another Wi-Fi device. So we're going to need to get a, an additional wireless access point. So there are many options available in the market. Um, in this example, we've got some here from Cisco, Meraki, and some from Mist. Um, but that's not all that you will need. You will then need to be able to, one, power the access point. So that means you're going to have to get some form of um, switch with a PoE capabilities or a power injector, or some come with their own 3-pin UK power supply. But that might be a bit tricky if you're mounting them to the ceiling or in some places. And then the other problem that you come across in home Wi-Fi is the cabling. You're going to need to run a cable from your home Wi-Fi router into the switch and then from the switch to your access point. So we need to make sure that cable distance is less than 100 meters. Um, but in some cases, it may not be feasible or possible to run cabling or it could be very expensive. And there is another option or solution which is called power inline adapters, um, which if you are trying to put an access point on your first floor and your home Wi-Fi router is on your ground floor, if the electrical circuit is on the same circuit for the ground and the first floor, you can plug in a power inline adapter into your main uh, electric supply on the ground floor and then another main socket on the first floor and then patch the Ethernet cable and it runs over the electric, which is quite a nice cheap option to not run cable. But even in Max house, new build house, your circuits from ground floor to first floor to second floor are not on the same circuit. So that's not an option there. So it's just something to be mindful of. Yeah, so theoretically, they can still work against theoretically, even if it sits on a different circuit. Uh, but I haven't tested it and it absolutely won't be the same quality if it doesn't sit on the same circuit. And also, I think it's worth mentioning here quickly that the home mesh solutions or, you know, signal extenders, in most cases, they will not fix the Wi-Fi issues properly. They might mask it, you know, it might extend your coverage, as the name suggests, a signal extender, but it will make it slower at the same time because the same Wi-Fi frames, they will have to travel higher distances now, you know, from your device through the extender to your Wi-Fi router. And it will take more time, consume more air time. So if you have a busy household, signal extenders are probably not the best idea to, to use. So I would always recommend positioning access point perfectly Changing it for a better access point if it's positioned perfectly, but it's still not good enough, but it's close, or add more access points, ideally cable. Agreed. So moving on, I mentioned about SkyQ earlier. Um, I'm just going to talk you through some of the steps that I took before I had any Wi-Fi access points at my house to um, improve my um, experience with, with Wi-Fi. If you just go to the next, next slide, please, Mike. Um, so if you connect to the SSID that is being broadcasted from your SkyQ home router, um, once you're connected to it, if you go to a internet browser and type in 192.168.0.1, it will load the login page for the SkyHub router. And now this is usually default at admin in Sky or admin and then the password of the SSID on the back of the box. And then once you've logged into the box, what we want to do, we want to separate the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz wireless SSIDs because by default, they're the same. And there's no real way that you can dif differentiate on your mobile device or your laptop which one you want to connect to. And like we discussed earlier, the 5 gigahertz band is usually a much less um, susceptible to interference and there's usually a lot less congestion on 5 gigahertz. 
So that's why we want to try and separate out the 2.4 and the 5. Um, so what I do in my home Sky router is my SSID. I just add a 2 to the end of my 2.4 gigahertz wireless SSID and then a 5 to my 5 gigahertz wireless SSID, which you can see here highlighted in the red boxes. Um, and then there's a, also a checkbox where it says synchronize the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz settings. You need to just uncheck that. And when you make these changes, you're quite likely to get kicked off and then have to rejoin. If you was, say for instance, joined on the 5 gigahertz SSID and then you change it, all the devices you had previously connected, you'll have to reconnect them to the network. So just be mindful of that. But what um, you want to make, yeah, what we want to do here is separate the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz SSIDs and then just come up with a way of being able to differentiate that. So very simply add in the 2 or a 5. When you open up the list of all those devices available, you'll be able to see which ones are 2.4 and the 5. That's a very important tip, actually, because if we don't do that, if we just use a single name for dual band SSID, then some devices, even though 5 gigahertz is available and spotless, they will still prefer to connect to 2.4, and we will not be able to ensure that the quality of the Wi-Fi is good in this congested band. Yeah, and the other thing that I haven't got highlighted there, but underneath the um, SSID, there says there's a, a another option that says desired channel. It's on the left-hand side. It's on channel 11. So if you've done your wireless scanning and you can see that a lot of your neighbors are say using channels one and channel six but channel 11 looks to be um clearer then you can set your wireless channels work on channel 11 but then on the five gigahertz band we only have the options to use the only supports channels for 36 40 44 and 48 and by default it's using 80 megahertz wide channels and the minimum you can go down to is 40 megahertz so we want to make sure here that if our neighbors are all using 80 megahertz wide channels on channel 36, that we also want to be using channel 36, 80 megahertz wide channels so that our primary channel 36 is the same as our neighbors. Um, because that can, if we had a 40 megahertz channel on channel 36 and our neighbors have a 80 megahertz channel on uh, channel 36, that can lead to some issues and then also if we have um, our channel set on channel 44 at 40 megahertz that can cause even more issues so um, it's just to be mindful of uh, avoiding or playing nicely with our noisy neighbors exactly okay and this is like a quick screenshot from the virgin media so it's very similar to to sky but Virgin, you know, it, they're known for slightly better quality of their uh, Wi-Fi routers on the market. So on the left-hand side, we can see 2.4 gigahertz that it's being used as, you know, BGN mixed. And it's probably not the greatest idea because, like, you know, BGN, we know that, you know, B and G, they're really, really old standards. So if you want to support those old devices, this will be at the expense of the performance of our newer devices, like you know, N capable and newer. Okay, so BG, like B, it's like you know, 1999 standard, so it just turned 20, even more. It's not the you know the newest, and those devices are very slow. And by supporting those devices, we are making sure that our new devices they won't be able to transmit as fast, at least some of the frames, making sure that the old devices can still understand. So. It probably makes sense to just use N if you can while disabling older standards, assuming all of your devices are supported. And on 5 gigahertz, uh, we can see uh, similar uh, things here. Actually, we didn't highlight the wireless mode, uh, but it will be the same. You can disable support for A, uh, for example. And on Virgin, you are not limited to just channels 36, 40, 44, and 48 you actually can choose higher channels. And as Matt has shown in a scan from his home Wi-Fi, most of the clients, they will, the neighbors, they will sit on channel 36. So on a Virgin, it's highly likely that you will be able to avoid interference with your neighbors. 
And also, you can choose, you know, between 20, 40, or 80 megahertz. You can't, you cannot set it to a static, like you know, uh, 40. It will be 20 or 40. So it will try to do 40 when it can. If it cannot, or if it thinks that it will cause more harm than good, then it will stick back to 20. So if everyone was using 20 megahertz, then it would have been much easier to avoid interference between between each other. I'm not sure what is the standard setup of Virgin, but I only assume that it will be also like you know 20, 40, and 80. So most clients they will sit on 80. But we have more options here, which is good. And BT, uh, I have BT, and so I didn't connect the hub until a few days ago when I was testing it for this webinar, because I, I'm not using it too much. Uh, but you can, oh, sorry for that, we have a postman. <laughs> Uh, you can check uh, you can check your gateway IP, uh, which to do so you have to go to the command line and type IP config as you can see on the left hand side. Uh, but normally it will be 192.168.1.254. If you put that in your browser, that should get you to the admin portal of your BT hub. And you can see on the landing page on wireless tab that you can have, you know, 2.4 and 5 both turned on on smart channel, which means it's dynamically adjusted to avoid interference uh, theoretically. But in the settings here on the left hand side, you can see that you can only set channels 1, 6 and 11, which is good because you don't want to set anything in between. Uh, it will cause more harm than just, you know, uh, sitting on the same channel as your neighbors actually. On the right hand side, you can see five gigahertz and it's the same story as with Sky. You only have four channels available and you don't even have a chance to change the channel width. And by default, it operates at 80 megahertz. So actually I haven't seen BT Hub getting lower than 80 megahertz. It always sits, at least from my ex experience, on 80. So it doesn't matter which channel you set, 36, 40, 44, or 48, you will still be occupying the same four channels. And if you are sitting on channel 36, but your neighbor sets their primary channel to let's say 40 or 44 or 48, it will make your experience even worse than it would have been if everyone was sitting on channel 36 at 80. And so with BT, you probably will not be able to avoid congestion uh, with contention with your neighbors. So in this situation, I just wouldn't use BT Home Hub in congested areas and I would use different Wi-Fi home router or enterprise access point solution. So then moving on to the home Wi-Fi security, we just wanted to cover this that pretty quickly because some people may feel that just now that they're at home they're secure, which unfortunately is not always the case because um, you, there are still threats out there. So please make sure you use strong passwords and we highly recommend using a password manager. I personally use Dashlane to generate strong passwords for me and to save all of the passwords so I don't have to repeat my passwords at all and different coming from different websites to website application to application. Um, it's not the same one. I mix it up and I use a strong password. It doesn't cost a lot of money. It's a very small investment for um, the amount of headache that it can cause you if you do somehow get your password compromised. And it's cross-platform as well, so you can use it on you know, Windows, Mac, Android, and iOS without having to remember all your passwords. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so, number two, very important thing is to use multi-factor authentication, which <laughs> means that even if your password is somehow you know, stolen or, or cracked, uh, and you know, if an attacker wants to authenticate to your service like your Gmail or your, you know, uh, whatever, home Facebook. or yeah, Facebook or enterprise mail client, then you should have a secondary uh, authentication factor like your phone that will prompt you to accept this authentication session. So it's, it's more secure. It's actually very secure multi-factor authentication. Mm -hmm. And then for your SSIDs, you usually have an option for what level of encryption that you want to use. Um, so we recommend that you use WPA2 or 3 if it's available and your clients support it. 
Um, so this will be the pre-shared key that you enter when you connect to an SSID. Um, try and make this quite secure and only share this with people that you trust. If you do have to give it to your neighbors for some reason or temporarily give it to some people that come over, um, if you're not too sure about them, we would recommend you change and update it fairly regularly so that if people are not, that if people are nearby to your home Wi-Fi, they can't still connect and use a old password. And it's just worth mentioning here to never use web, W-E-P, wireless, wired equivalent protection. Because it not only can be cracked in minutes by an amateur, it also limits the uh, speed, data rate that the Wi-Fi will be operating at. So even if your router can do a few hundred megs, you will be limited to 54 if you enable web. And open is open, so that leaves you literally no encryption. So exactly. steer, steer away from that. <laughs> yeah, and especially now, like, you know, with the coronavirus issue that we face globally, phishing emails, it's something that is very relevant right now. So be careful with opening links in your emails, making sure that, you know, that you all only open, uh, you know, emails and click on links from sources that you 100% trust because they can lead to harvesting your passwords, stealing your identity, you know, encrypting your computer and then asking money for decrypting it. It's, it can be bad. Yeah. And when you do go to websites, make sure that they are the website that you go to use something called HTTPS, which is a secure protocol rather than if it was just HTTP where, um, you would notice this most if you see a padlock next to the um, first part of the web, web address that you go to. If you do go to one that is unsecure, never input any sensitive data into that web browser. Because it's, clear, it's just clear text, right? If it's without the S standing for SSL. Mm -hmm. And lastly, if you have access to a VPN in like public spaces, so now we don't go to public spaces too much, but if you start going back to public spaces, and you are connecting to the open network, there is no encryption on the, you know, on the wireless network uh, level. So if you, are, if you want an extra peace of mind, it makes sense to create a secure tunnel back to your organization or your home browser if it, if it supports it and connect through, through that. So your transmission can be eavesdropped on. So a quick summary, um, we want to make sure that we place access points or your home Wi-Fi router as centrally as possible in your house and away from any obstructions. Number two would be to go for the fastest available, practical, not too expensive uh, broadband that you can get. That's very important. Yes, and, and do not bond channels together on 2.4 gigahertz ever. Make sure we stick to the channels 1, 6, and 11. And we want to try and avoid the neighbors as much as possible, not only with coronavirus, but with Wi-Fi as well. That's correct. And also make sure to use as secure you know, encryption, a strong encryption, and a secure long password as possible to make sure that you know, you're not that easily hackable. And then use the use the five gigahertz frequency band for your most important most important devices if you can and they support them. But if you can, we mean like you know five gigahertz. It will not travel as far as two point four. So in some scenarios, we will be forced to use two point four or IoT devices like you know Wi-Fi bulbs, uh, some you know cameras, baby monitors. They can only fit on two point four. So we have no choice. And that leads us to questions and answers. Uh, so I'm not sure if we have any questions from uh, from the uh, audience. No, so if you have any questions for the guys, just type it in the Q&A box below. Or if you think of any kind of after this, feel free to reach out and we, we can come back to you in time. Of course. So we would be super happy to answer any questions. If you might have some like, you know, specific questions about your home uh, setup, uh, don't hesitate to, to reach out. You know, we are happy to, to help if we are available. Um, yeah, stay safe, guys, if you don't have any questions. So we still don't have anything? Not yet, but thank you so much, uh, Mac and Matt. That was brilliant. And um, I'm sure plenty of us now will be going and, and having a little bit of a look at our configuration at home.
Thank you, Haley, for hosting it. It was an absolute blast to, to be here and do this webinar. Thank you, Matt, and stay safe, take care. Yeah. Thanks, Mac. Thank you, Haley. Bye. Bye. Bye.